Welcome to the latest Gramophone podcast. I'm James Jolly, Gramophone Editor-in-Chief, and this month we join countertenor James Bowman and harpsichordist Mahan Esfahani in Oxford as they prepare for their Wigmore Hall concert, James Bowman's final London recital. And we also explore some of this month's recommended releases. But first, Yannick nézé Séguin. He's emerged in recent years as one of the most exciting young conductors of today. I caught up with the French-Canadian maestro to talk about what conducting means to him and about his plans for when he takes over as music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And we started by discussing how Yannick feels about taking on an orchestra with such a tradition. What we're doing every day in our world, our musical world, is to actualize to now something which is a tremendous heritage from the past. I mean, we keep doing this every day when we take a piece of music, or when it's new music, of course, it's different, but even this has influences. And so for me, that connection to time and to past is essential. What's also essential is to make it alive now. So that's where historical orchestras are so fascinating to me because that history is what I want to hear and what I want to preserve and what I want to encourage. And yet it has to be active now. So we will never obviously take a decision just because Stokowski was doing it this way, so we should do it this way and no. But I won't do the opposite, say Stokowski was doing it this way, so therefore now this is the past, we need to be different. No, I think there's a fine balance And especially, you mentioned Philadelphia, it's an orchestra where, because of the link between Curtis Institute and the the orchestra, because in large part there was this, um, 60% of the orchestra now comes from Curtis. I mean, so this is unlike most orchestras, except maybe Vienna, where there's this Mm. continuity of teachers to students, teachers to students, which means that there is a real connection still to that sound that sustained sound of the past. And I find it fascinating how easy it is to somehow just turn that on again. And I need to make careful choices of repertoire. I was going to say, does does it kind of encourage you down certain repertoire alleys? Yeah, that's that's the, the... In Philadelphia, that's definitely my thinking. I want to uh, explore different uh, areas, not, not areas, different pieces which have not been done by the orchestra. There's some... I mean, something li- like little, Bruckner. Yeah. I mean, there is yeah. no Bruckner tradition, really. No, Bruckner. I mean, they did with Sabalish, mm. but it's true, it's not really documented, and the orchestra plays that beautifully, so we will certainly do a lot. And that is, is a good example, because this is where also that sound of the strings and the very typical brass sound can be of a great asset to that repertoire. So there is still something to explore, which is not only redoing the same, 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 same pieces again and again that they've been doing and recording uh, famously with Ormandy and uh, Stokowski and also Muti, but yet, uh, for example, I won't do so much French music there. Uh, I like it. I mean, they play beautifully. Dutois is doing a lot of it, and this is a big part of myself. But as I arrived in Rotterdam and decided to go more towards French music, to encourage those colors that they have developed with Gergiev on Russian music and apply them to French music, in Philadelphia would be very different. So this is due, of course, probably a little bit to where I am in my life, in my own development as an artist, but mostly has to do with the history uh, of an orchestra. And will you ease back on sort of a lot, not a lot because you've got a lot of orchestras, but... I mean, outside the kind of yeah, yeah. a kind of kind yeah. of four main your four main orchestras. Two thousand thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. When I look at my diary, I see four names, maybe five because there's New York. But New York is combined uh, with the Met, and it's is combined with Philadelphia, mm. and combined with Montreal. So yeah, I do see Rotterdam, Philadelphia, Montreal, London, and a bit of New York, and that's it, for two seasons full and. That was the idea, that uh, to 
he has to ease on that aspect. Yes, it, it's true. I have a lot of families in a way because it's four. It's not only one or two, uh, but let's face it, it's two main ones for my time. It's Rotterdam and Philadelphia, which will be the main ones. And Montreal is only four times a year. And so is uh, London. So it's well, like, quite concentrated. I mean, when you come yes, here, it yes. ten, you tend to do a number. Two of programs a week and some touring as well. And that's nice. I mean, the development with the orchestra here is wonderful at the LPO. And then, you know, in 2015, who knows? You know, I, now I think I've four or five years in, ahead of me where I, I don't want really to think what next. <laughs> Yannick Nézé-Séguin conducting the Rotterdam Philharmonic in Bellius' Symphonie Fantastique, available now on BIS. Martin Cullingford went to Oxford to meet countertenor James Bowman and harpsichordist Mahan Esfahani, who were rehearsing for their concert at Wigmore Hall on Saturday, May the 21st. The occasion will be James Bowman's final London recital. It's astonishing to recall that he began his illustrious career back in the late 1960s. And Martin began by asking him about those early days and about his great predecessor, Alfred Della. It was just getting started with Della, but people didn't take it seriously. You'd never fill the Wigmore Hall with a recital like me. You'd never sell records. I mean, he made a few records, that's what got it started. He gave it a profile. There had been uh, people around, but Alfred had the sort of charisma. And he, was an, he was a very interesting man to watch. I only saw him once in Keble College, Keble College Hall, giving a recital. And I was struck by the smallness of his voice, but also his presence, which was magnificent. You knew that somebody was going to give a very special sound when he stood up to sing. But, I mean, as you say, it was very much a minority interest. Nobody took it really seriously. But how different it is now, which, of course, you're, you're part of... Of that change. Well, I'm, I'm through all that. I mean, I'm the, grand, the grandfather now. It's totally different now, isn't it? Completely different. It's all thanks to the record companies. Entirely. I mean, one, one owes a lot to the recording industry. I mean, I think our, my generation made more records than anybody. I made 186, which people don't make now. Why don't you um, tell me a little bit about the repertoire that you've chosen to perform on Saturday? Well, I think our choice of repertoire was based on repertoire for which I, as a listener, have known James, and I think many of us have respected James uh, for. So Purcell, naturally, was, uh, was, was an immediate choice, uh, and, and Handel, um, to mm. whose camp James has been converting me. But I think your fans who are coming, of which there'll be many, it won't be only my aficionado. Uh, well, I'll be we'll playing. Want to hear you playing Bach. I'll be playing quite a bit of solo yes. music. Yes. Uh, yes. So I'll be playing Bach. I'll be playing the French Overture and exactly. and a few other bits and bobs by by Bach. And uh, of course, obviously, I don't have that sort of identification with the repertoire because I don't have that kind of career yet. But uh, I guess people know me for playing Bach. Sure. So this is quite important for me. Um, that's sort of how, I don't know, I think we came around in a very casual way, really. We did. We, we just sort of hashed it up. I mean, uh, I, I said to Mahana that I wanted to do a final London concert, and it seemed a nice idea to do it with a young, illustrious, talented harpsichord. And since that person wasn't available, he asked me. <laughs> 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 but we were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, who's, who sadly died now. Um, uh, a distinguished um, cleric who was the dean of the Chapel's Royal when I sang in the Chapel Royal Choir at St James's Palace and then he retired and came to New College and met Mahan Yes, when I was starting my fellowship at New College He was very kind to Mahan he suggested we got together and did a recital oh. so although he is no longer with us um, it's nice to think that he initiated the whole project really he would have been thrilled to have been to uh, to have heard this, our collaboration, I'm sure. And accordingly, we've dedicated it to his we have. memory. Yes, he was yes. a very, very splendid man, but uh, he was a, a, a lover of both the harpsichord and the, and, the, and the voice, you see. Oh. 
But um, no, I mean, we had never met before. So we'll probably never meet again. On <laughs> on Depends on Saturday, doesn't it? The rehearsal's going so well. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting occasion, but also perhaps an emotional one. On, on well, I, I, I don't want to use the word emotional because that implies, I mean, I, I feel quite detached about it in a way. I don't think singers should go on beyond their sell by date, and 70 is a very good uh, time to draw a line. But there's a lot of very fine singers around, and they should all, you know, they deserve. I think one should move over and let them get on with it. Not that I sing much in London anyway. I don't exactly appear regularly anymore. Just as you've talked about how the countertenor has, 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 has changed in, in the role it's played in the music world over your, your career, that period also saw um, a big change in the way that the harpsichord was, was seen and the role it came to play and, and, and does play in today's music world. In, in, a, in a way, you're now an inheritor of, of that change and that development. It's been interesting to hear J James talk about a period in which the countertenor wasn't taken seriously, because I think we've come to a lull in the harpsichord as well, where increasingly for a young musician, for a young artist, one hears from uh, promoters and people in the business and people who's, who are very tough with their, uh, who have a hard time with their, real their sense of reality, uh, being disturbed as far as the music business is concerned, saying that, well, no one takes the harpsichord seriously. And sometimes I feel, I think the countertenor, obviously it's in good shape, but I feel like the harpsichord in some ways, sometimes I feel like I have to start, if not at square one, maybe at square three, you know, it's two steps forward and one step backward. And so, you know, obviously working with someone like James for me is inspiring because James started in a period when it wasn't taken as seriously and you know the other day I was reading about Goosens the oboes and they were yeah. talking in this uh, in this book about how he gained respect for his instrument and it wasn't taken seriously mm. and I think well two generations before that the oboe was taken seriously and see instruments have ups and downs and uh, in some ways of course the burgeoning early music movement has been good but I also wonder has it relegated the harpsichord to a position of sort of backup band for well other instruments or other things and so uh you know i'm really obviously honored and, and and delighted that james gave me the option i guess you could call it to share the recital as a soloist as well and you know and that's a really i think it's important that you should be as a soloist not just as an accompanist well it's a great you know in the baroque period soloists accompanists composer were all the same thing mm. you know and i take honor in, in that um, but it's all it's all it's all one discipline. You can't separate them, mm. you know. So that's what I that's what I think. But I mean, for many years it was people like Kenneth Gilbert, Gustav Leonhardt. Um, Before that, Kirkpatrick. Ralph Kirkpatrick. Leonhard, I mean, it was uh, uh, um, George Landowski. Uh, you know, albeit playing quite uh, different instruments and the Tom Goff stuff with the pedals and all yeah. that. That was all very much an antique approach. But I mean. In, my, in the years that I've been around, I've always been aware of the harpsichord as a solo instrument, but not that common. I mean, I remember George Malcolm playing the Arne harpsichord concerto at the opening of the Queen Elizabeth Hall with great aplomb. It was wonderful. It's amazing when I hear people telling me that George Malcolm could pack Royal Festival Hall and then pe have people out of their seats. And, he could. You know, well, it's, George had a, f a facility for playing faster than anybody I've ever heard in my life. No. I've never heard such fast finger work on them but he used pedals all the time and made a great you know thing about you know, and so. the recordings it's amazing i mean he can mm -hmm. sort of gradate volume through the use of pedals and yes he did and i think you know it was quite romantic i mean the leonhardt approach was not for him no but even Leon, i mean leonhardt's famous for the quote that if you seek to be convincing you're authentic so um you know a lot of people use leonhardt's <clears throat> name for example mm -hmm. to sort of beat others over the head but leonhardt would be the last person in the world to do that Mahanis Rahani, James Bowman, thank you so much for letting me sing on, on the rehearsal and to, uh, to talk to you. And uh, I really look forward to the concert on Saturday at the Wigmore Hall. James Bowman and Mahan Esfahani perform at Wigmore Hall London on Saturday, May the 21st. And if you can't make that, you can hear Mahan perform Bach's Goldberg Variations in Brighton on May the 25th and in Oxford on June the 3rd and at the Proms on July the 18th. 
Now, I'm joined by Gramophone's editor, James Inver, to talk about his choice of uh, editor's choice for this month. Uh, an interesting, as usual, a eclectic bunch of recordings. Um, there's one particularly caught my eye, Marta Argerich, Live at Lugano. Tell us about that. Well, every year these Live at Lugano sets roll in and land on my desk, and there's always a treasure trove of wonderful things here. Uh, for those who don't know, um, the Lugano Festival, or more accurately, the Martha Argerich Project at Lugano um, is a place where Argerich, one of the most celebrated pianists around today and also one of the most elusive, um, retires every summer to work with chosen friends and young talents, um, the best of which end up on this set which comes out uh, on EMI every year. This year is um, quite simply the most dazzling set that I've, I've come across in this series. Um, she just seems to be on absolutely inspired form um, she's joined by the likes of the Capson brothers and Stephen Kovacevic and what we now know as the usual suspects and the whole thing's an absolute joy. And what would you single out from this set? Well, without a doubt, one of my uh, absolute favourites on this is the Chopin First Piano Concerto. It's simply an amazing performance. I, I think I listened to it five times in the first couple of days of having the set. Above all, it's the most wonderfully subtle of performances. Um, like all the greatest pianists, Argerich knows how to just touch in um, wealth of emotion. They're, they're suggested by just the, the lightest touch. Um, but, but it's more than that. Um, if they say, here's a way to put it, if they say that great acting is about being able to show more than one thing happening emotionally at any one time, you have to, as we do in life, have to show happiness and regret and nostalgia, or whatever it may be. Well, Ulrich, um can do that on the piano in a way few other people Maybe no one else in the world at the moment can, and she does it here. So that's one I'd recommend. There's also enshrining her regular partnership with Stephen Kovacevic, um, the Bartok Sonata for Two Pianos and Percussion, which is a terrifically lucid performance. Um, Bartok often gets uh, hammered home, <laughs> as it were, to the high heavens, um, with people going for power uh, and sheer volume. Here, these very able musicians know better than that, and they find the progression, they find the logic, and they find the storytelling in the work. <laughs> That was part of the Bartok Sonata for Two Pianos and Percussion, Marta Argri, Stephen Kovacevic, and the percussionist Louis Sauvetre. Now, there's another intriguing disc that features the piano amongst your list, uh, a Grieg disc that sort of folds time back on itself. Tell us a bit about that. Yes, this is rather lovely and in some ways rather bizarre, but anyway, it's a, it's, it's a revelation of its kind. The pianist Sigurd Slutterbreck, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, is listed as pianist on this, this wonderful set called Chasing the Butterfly, alongside one Edvard Grieg, of whom I'm sure I have heard. What this is, Slatterbreck uh, goes back to Grieg's house, um, and he tries to recapture more than just um, the, uh, the music in that particular location. Um, he has a theory that over the years, we, meaning the world's professional pianists, uh, have smoothed out the... Um, idiosyncrasies and and through that the character of the playing in Grieg's day and, and he argues that Grieg's compositions um, require this kind of this kind of uh, character in the playing. So he goes and plays on Grieg's piano uh, as he believes Grieg wanted these pieces, the lyric pieces, to be played um, and what comes across is, is indeed a, a wonderfully characterful traversal. At the same time we get Grieg himself uh, and if you listen through the haze, the sonic haze, you hear, in fact, that Slatterbreck is right. Um, Grieg is an incredibly characterful pianist, and anything further than the kind of uh, smooth autopilot we get from so many pianists today couldn't be imagined. And one of the tracks rather cleverly splices the two pianists together, so you can hear Grieg followed by Slatterbreck. A 
part of a new disc of Grieg's piano music, Chasing the Butterfly on the C-Max label, with Edvard Grieg playing alongside Sigurd Slutterbrick. Now, every month, one of your ten choices gets singled out as the disc of the month. And this month, it's a disc of choral music by the Czech composer Jan Dismas Selenka, one of the real originals in music. And what attracted your attention to this one? Well, this is uh, an incredible issue by any standards, um, but added to the fact that we don't really know the music, this, this would be recording of the month in almost any month. Um, Zelenka's a, a fascinating composer because, as you say, he was one of the great originals. Um, you hear Zelenka and you always know that what you're listening to um, is composed by him, and this is deeply personal territory for him. Zelenka was effectively the head of music for the Catholic Church in Saxony, and the King of Saxony, known as Augustus the Strong, uh, was a convert to Catholicism uh, and a music lover to boot. So the two of them had a real affinity. And when Augustus died, uh, it fell to Zelenka's lot to compose the music for the commemorations. Um, and there were three days of those, so a lot of music to compose. Nevertheless, and, and also notwithstanding the speed at which Zelenka had to compose, this music, this, this funeral music, is so deeply felt and yet on a grand scale and yet intimate, uh, contradictory though th those sound, um, that it's quite breathtaking. You just get a sense in some ways of a kind of a sort of howl of agony from this man who's lost his, not only his patron and his champion, but also um, a fellow spiritual soul. It's a really, really emotional experience and it's given a really fantastic performance. <laughs> was an excerpt from Officium Defunctorum by Jan Dismas Selenka, performed by Collegium Vocale 1704 and Václav Lux on accent. Thank you for listening, and just a reminder that you can subscribe to Gramophone as a digital magazine. Just visit gramophone.co.uk for more details. See you next month. <laughs>